Good evening, this is Goldie. It's Wednesday, August 18th, 2010. Please become a follower of mine, a follower of mine on Ustream. I'm uh, currently working on a website where I will post links to the articles I refer to and where the rants will permanently reside. Remember, most importantly, I rant so you don't have to. I've said it before, I do this rant for purely selfish purposes and it makes me think. I want to thank my friends who watch and call me and send me emails. Without you, I'm nothing. Your comments and disagreements with me make me think even harder. Friday, I spoke with a friend who believes that I am a raving liberal, whatever that means, probably a pro-Obama Democrat. I spoke about how Obama, contrary to being a Marxist, is just more of the same, and that the stimulus under Bush went to Halliburton, and the stimulus under Obama goes to the state governments and unions. He flinched, and I realized that I will succeed in this rant over time, at least how I selfishly define success. Let me summarize what I'll be talking about today. I'll talk about the current immigration political message for this November. I will talk about the feeling that Chinese migrants feel or have when they are locked into an encampment. And these are citizens, not illegals, in China. I will move into anchor babies in the 14th Amendment, then racial profiling in the example of a certain Arizona sheriff. I will talk about racism in the words terrorist and Islamic terrorist throughout all media. I'll talk a little about BP again, sorry, but in the context of the defect that allows Obama to give stimulus money to unions, specifically state workers and teachers. The current message out there that's only going to get louder and louder. Last week I spoke about the Florida Attorney General and his proposed immigration law that in some ways is more draconian and potentially unconstitutional than the Arizona law. He was trailing his opponent in the Republican primary by several points at the time, at the time that he proposed his law. August 13th, two days later, he was leading his opponent. Totally a political move since the Florida legislature doesn't even meet until March. And the Supreme Court may make the law unconstitutional even before it's written. But none of that is cared about or discussed by those special Republicans in Florida. God bless them. Another message that came out of the signing into law of the border enhancement legislation last week requires comment. On August 11th, 2010, Obama signed a $600 million immigration law adding border patrol agents, etc. A pretty big chunk of change. On August 14th, 2010, there was an interview on Fox with a before the commercial message of, is it enough? A Democratic rep from Arizona and the Fox correspondent showed a poll that 61% of Americans believe that it's impossible to secure the border. What? I mean, these guys do a poll for whatever they want to do a poll for. I, this is the first time we've even heard this one. But anyway, Fox is clearly talking out both sides of their mouth at the same time. And that's me putting it politely. It's clear that whatever the Democrats do is wrong. They asked for money, more security, they got more money. If this had been Bush, Fox and the Republicans would have been for it. Don't expect to hear any talk from Republicans or Fox about the passage of this bill, except in the context of, is it enough? I'm gonna talk more about immigrations in a few minutes. Immigration in a few minutes. All right, I'm going to continue on my surveillance right to privacy rant, which will lead into immigration. An August 12, 2010 article in the Austin American Statesman is horrifying. It's entitled, In China's Capital, Sealed Management Locks in Migrants. I think it gives you the feeling of what 1984, Total Recall, or Minority Report, or what I have warned the U.S. in the future will look like. Since rational argument and thought does not seem to work, getting people into the feeling may be a way forward, a way to get to people's hearts, minds, and fears. Let me read from the article and just put yourself in these people's place if you can. Beijing. The government calls it sealed management. China's capital has started gating and locking some of its lower income neighborhoods overnight with police or security checking identification identification papers around the clock. 
It's Beijing's latest effort to reduce rising crime, often blamed on the millions of rural Chinese migrating to cities for work. The capital's Communist Party secretary wants the approach promoted citywide. But some state media and experts say the move not only looks bad, but imposes another layer of control on the country's already stigmatized vulnerable migrants. So far, gates have sealed off 16 villages in the sprawling southern suburbs, where migrants are attracted to cheaper rents. In some of the villages, migrants outnumber permanent residents 10 to 1. In some ways, this is like the conflict between Americans and illegal immigrants in the states. I'm going to tell you why that's not true in a minute. The local residents feel threatened by the influx of migrants, said Wang Yuqin, an associate geography professor at the University of Albany in New York who has studied gating and political control in China. The risk is that the government can control people's private life if it wants to. That's our risk also. The gated villages are just the latest indignity for China's migrant workers who already face limited access to schooling and government services and are routinely blamed by city residents for rising crime. Used to the hardship of the farm and the lack of privilege, migrants seem to be taking the new controls in stride. Jia Yangui said he accepts the new system as a trade-off for escaping farm work in the northern province of Xingxi. He arrived in Beijing less than two months ago and lives with a relative in one of the gated villages. I'm not even going to say the name of it. He sells early pancakes just inside one of the gates. Anyway, it's not as strict as before when we migrants would be detained on the way to the toilet, said Jia's relative middle-aged woman who gave her family name as Zhang. Sealed management looks like this. Gates are placed at the street and alley entrances to the villages, which are collections of walled compounds sprinkled with, with shops and outdoor vendors. The gates are locked between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m., except for one main entrance manned by security guards or police. They to check identification papers. Security guards roam the villages by day. Closing up the village benefits everyone, read one banner put up when the first permanent gated village was introduced in April. But some Chinese question whether problems arising from the growing gap between the country's rich and poor can be fixed with locks and surveillance cameras. Sound familiar? It's a ridiculous idea, said Li Wenhua, who does private welfare work with migrant workers in Beijing. This is definitely not a good long-term strategy. The government should dig up the in-depth causes of crime and improve basic public services such as education and health care to these people. Crime has been rising steadily over the past two decades as China moved from state planning and free markets and Chinese once, Chinese once locked into set jobs began, began moving around the country for work. Violent crime in China jumped 10% last year with 5.3 million reported cases of homicide, robbery and rape, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences reported in February. Sealed management was born in the village of Luau San Yu during the Beijing Olympics in 2008, when the government was eager to control its migrant population. The village used it again during the sensitive 60th anniversary of Communist China last year. Officials decided to make the pra practice permanent this year. 80%, again, 80% of the permanent residents applaud the practice, said Zhuo, Zhuo Rufang, deputy director of Lao Sin Yu's village committee. He didn't say how many migrants approved, though they outnumber the native residents by 7,000 to 700. Gating has been an easy and effective way to control population throughout Chinese history, said Huang, the geography professor. In past centuries, some walled cities would impose curfews and close their gates overnight. In the first decade of communist rule, the desire for top-down organization and control showed in work unit compounds, usually guarded and enclosed. As the economy has grown, privately run gated communities with their own security have emerged in the biggest cities, catering to the well-to-do Chinese and expatriates, offering upscale houses and facilities such as pools and gyms. The new gated vi villages in Beijing are different. To put it crudely, gated communities in the city are a way for the upper middle class and urban rich to keep out trespassers, whereas gated villages represent a way for the state to keep in or contain the problem of migrant workers who live in these villages. Pao Chun Pyu, an associate geography professor at the National University of Singapore, who has studied the issue, said in an email. Jiang Zheng Kuang, a supermarket owner in the gated compound of Luau San Yu, told the China Daily newspaper in May that he doesn't even know if he'll be in business next year because of the drop in customers. Before, the streets were crowded with people in the afternoon, but now the village is deserted, he said. I can't understand why the government has invested such a large amount of money into putting up these useless fences rather than repair our dirty public restrooms and bumpy roads. Sorry for reading that article, but just I needed to get you in that, that feeling. Now, try and think what that would feel like. These are citizens of China, not illegals. 
not illegal immigrants, contrary to what the article talked about. Although it is a part of the feeling that is felt by Hispanics in Arizona, even prior to the Arizona law, Virginia, and Highland Park in Dallas as examples. The article talks about 80% of permanent Chinese res residents approve the practice. Of course they do, just like 61% of Americans approve the Arizona law and probably 0% have actually read the Arizona law. Beating the dead horse, this is where surveillance cameras, sobriety checkpoints, and Vea Ayopepa's laws are taking us. You say you don't care, then vote against these things because I care what they do to me. And I've said before, you have no capital R right to say it's okay for a cop to stop me for no reason or point a surveillance camera into my daughter's shower. Let me go ahead and talk about <clears throat> anchor babies in the 14th Amendment. By the way, anchor babies refer to any baby born in the U.S., which is then a citizen automatically. I really don't have an opinion to start off with, although I do have a couple of questions for you. If you support changing the 14th Amendment to stop this loophole, as it's called, I know and I see what your interest is. It's actually a coherent argument. The bigger question is, what is the interest that you are trying to protect if you like the concept of anchor babies and don't want to change the 14th Amendment to exclude these babies born to illegal immigrants in this country? Now let's go back to my immigration rant, where I believe that we need to secure the border pursuant to Garrett Hardin's ideas of limited resources, my ideas of a declining standard of living leading to a reduction of services for everyone, and that we need to get our arms around the total number of people that are going to get services from the government. I believe we have limitations. Also, in that immigration rant, I opined that there would be no way to ship 12 million people back to wherever they came from without racial profiling, which I believe is wrong in all circumstances. Now, let's go ahead and read the 14th Amendment for the anchor baby argument. By the way, the anchor baby argument is a Republican argument that pregnant women are illegally coming into the U.S. solely in order to have their baby here, which baby would then become a U.S. citizen automatically per the 14th Amendment, passed in 1868. I quote the 14th, <clears throat> or at least a section of the 14th. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now I went ahead and went to uh, Wikipedia, God bless them, um, and this is from them, and I'm quoting. Section 1 of the 14th Amendment formally defines citizenship and protects a person's civil and political rights from being abridged or denied by any state. This represented the Congress's overruling of the Dred Scott decision to the extent that the decision held that black people were not and could not become citizens of the United States or enjoy any of the privileges and immunities of citizenship. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 had already granted U.S. citizenship to all persons born in the United States. The framers of the 14th Amendment added this principle into the Constitution to prevent the Supreme Court from ruling the Civil Rights Act of 1866 to be unconstitutional for lack of congressional authority to enact such a law, or a future Congress from altering it by, by a mere majority vote. Love that. This section was also in response to the Black Codes, which Southern states had passed in the wake of the 13th Amendment, which ended slavery in the United States. Those laws attempted to return freed slaves to something like their former condition by, among other things, restricting their movement, forcing them to enter into year-long labor contracts, and by preventing them from suing or testifying in court. Finally, this section was in response to violence against black people within the southern states. A joint committee on Reconstruction found that only a constitutional amendment could protect the rights and welfare of black people within those states." End quote. It's so nice to read some reasoning behind a constitutional amendment so that a Supreme Court or a Congress could not overrule it. 
That's the concept I'm getting from their original intent of the 14th Amendment. How profound and correct for such a fundamental change that needs to happen. Now, in deciding whether or not I'm for or against it, maybe if it were part of comprehensive immigration reform, enhanced security, and a path to citizenship, then this might be a part of a total plan on how to assimilate the 12 million that are in this country into being citizens and taxpayers. Now, I don't disagree, or I agree, there are also unintended consequences of changing the law, or any law, many of which I have not yet thought about or heard. Please start thinking about that, okay? I think, however, that it may be a waste of the huge resources necessary for a constitutional amendment. If we don't tag on to this thing, my previous rants about the need for a constitutional amendment to fix the structural regulatory defect that caused BP, the economic collapse, privatizations to favored donors, and no bid giveaway contracts for Halliburton, among other things detailed in those rants. Again, the amendments I have proposed are term limits for legislators, no revolving door for regulators to industry, and as moveon.org has petitioned, most importantly, Exxon and other corporations and unions is or are not a person entitled to donate as much as they want to campaigns which was the Citizens United case. Again, that last part is that we want to make sure that Exxon and other corporations are not considered people entitled to a free speech right that allows them to give unlimited sums to campaigns. So if you think about it, maybe it's worth getting a convention going, a constitutional convention going, so that these other issues can be discussed. Please note that the proponents of changing the 14th Amendment are arguing the original intent argument of the drafters of the amendment, I guess, which was to make sure the children of slaves became citizens. And I ask, what is original intent anyway? I don't think it's a good argument. Um, did you know that the income tax was to replace the liquor taxes lost during prohibition and it was supposed to go away? Should that have any bearing as to whether or not we have an income tax? I took constitutional law. And the original intent of anyone is very, very unclear and usually meaningless. And it's usually written after the fact. That's the point of putting it in writing. We can read the words in the amendment, in the Constitution. If the founders and the drafters of the 14th Amendment wanted their intent to be conclusive, they would have stated so in the Constitution or the 14th Amendment. The Constitution was meant to be a living document. We must live with the unintended consequences. I'm just bringing up a few points. Those guys, those drafters, they were very smart. I think that a change, and, and I got an email from a friend of mine right before this. His point was, build the fence, stop the influx of illegal immigrants, and that will end the argument of the anchor babies. It's that simple. I can agree. I, I think that a change to the 14th Amendment alone will be a useless endeavor without border security and a path to citizenship. Let me hear, please think about this and let me hear from you on this issue. This is kind of the first time I had thought about it due to a friend talking to me about it last week. Now I'm going to re-digress into the racial profiling portion of immigration uh, that I set forth in my uh, immigration rant and later, later rants. I stated that racial profiling should never be used, never be used in this country. Sorry. It's just not something that we want here to have somebody singled out by color, race, sexual orientation, sex, age, etc. I stated that it's difficult, if not impossible, to give an opinion on racial profiling if you are white, since you could never be profiled. And I'm going to repeat it. It's a tough soundbite. It's impossible to give an opinion on racial profiling if you're white. You, since you can't be profiled. So you can't say whether or not profiling will bother you or not. Okay? I talked about how a whole bunch of Americans in Fox and other polls agreed, but they also said that racial, okay, they agreed with the Arizona law, but that they also, uh, they also said that racial profiling prohibitions in the Arizona law, and federal law for that matter, would be sufficient to prevent the practice. I completely disagreed and said that, in fact, this law would encourage the practice of racial profiling. Let me read the federal investigation of a leading anti-immigration sheriff. <clears throat> the article is from the Austin American Statesman on August 18, 2010. 
and it's entitled, Justice Department Threatens to Sue Controver Controversial Arizona Sheriff. It's impossible to paraphrase the thing, so I apologize, and then I'll just read it. Washington. A federal investigation of a controversial Arizona sh sheriff known for tough immigration enforce enforcement has intensified in recent days, escalating the conflict between the Obama administration and officials in the border state. So it's already being characterized as a uh, Obama versus Arizona. Justice Department officials have issued a rare threat to sue Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaolo I can't even read it, sorry, if he doesn't cooperate with their investigation into whether he discriminates against Hispanics. The civil rights investigation is one of two targeting the man who calls himself America's toughest sheriff. A federal grand jury in Phoenix is examining whether Arpaio has used his power to investigate and intimidate political opponents and whether his office misappropriated funds, sources said. The standoff comes just weeks after the Justice Department sued Arizona and Governor Jan Brewer over the state's new immigration law. By the way, that's the message you're going to hear, that this is nothing more than Obama versus Arizona. I, my point here is, of course, that this is examples of racial profiling that already exist. Uh, going back to the article, one scene is a quirky figure who dressed inmates in pink underwear. Arpaio has in recent years become a kind of folk hero to those favoring his heavily, heavily publicized crime sweeps, conducted mostly in Hispanic neighborhoods. But civil rights groups accuse the 78-year-old lawman of racial profiling. And some Maricona, Maricopa County officials say Arpaio has launched meritless corruption investigations against officials who have criticized his policies or opposed his requests. Excuse me. Those allegations are at the core of the Justice Department investigation, according to documents, lawyers and people who have been questioned by FBI agents and the grand jury. Arpaio's lawyers contend that the investigations are politically motivated. Justice Department, Justice Department officials denied any political considerations, whatever. <clears throat> the Civil Rights Division investigation began in March 2009 as focusing on whether Arpaio's department engaged in discriminatory police practices and unconstitutional searches and seizures, along with allegations that his jail discriminated against Hispanic inmates, according to a letter the division sent Arpaio. A complaint to the Justice Department said even bilingual jail guards are required to speak to inmates only in English, which can endanger their medical care. The jail was also accused of forcing Hispanic visitors to, f to the facility to fill out a citizen check form, the letter said. In an August 3rd letter to Arpaio's lawyers, Thomas Perez, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division, said the Sheriff's Office refused repeated quests, requests to turn over documents to meet with investigators. Arpaio's resistance is highly unusual. Justice Department officials said even the threat of such a lawsuit is rare. They plan to meet with the lawyers next week in a last just effort to forestall litigation. Um, sounds vaguely familiar like what is going on in China with its own citizens. And I have to ask you, this guy is making inmates wear pink underwear, okay? If you go to visit, you have to show you're a citizen. He did sweeps through neighborhoods, okay? Again, it's allegations, could be totally political. But for purposes of what we're talking about, let's assume they're true. Is this what you want if the allegations are true? And is this what the modern Arizona and the rest of the United States is going to look like? Many states are passing laws allowing this stop to see if you're a citizen, but don't racial profile. I'm completely disgusted, and I do not believe it can be done. Please prove to me that it can. <clears throat> Slightly related to racial profiling, it's just pure racism. An uh, August 18, 2010 article in the Austin American Statesman is titled, Gunman, a gunman had explosives in trailer, police say. And the title is very important. Gunman had explosives in trailer, police say. Not once was the word terrorist or terrorism used in the article to describe the white terrorist. Get it? In Wikipedia, terrorist is redirected to the word terrorism, which is defined as, and I quote, terrorism is the systemic, systematic use of terror, especially as a means of coercion. At present, the international community has been unable to formulate a universally agreed, legally binding criminal law definition of terrorism. Common definitions of terrorism refer only to those violent acts which are intended to create fear, terror, are 
perpetuated for a religious, political, or ideological goal, and deliberately target or disregard the safety of non-combatants. End quote. That's what this guy was doing. He put a bunch of bombs in, in, a, in a trailer, tried to catch it on fire, and then he was going to shoot people as they came out of this police station. Now, think of what that definition is, okay? Common definitions of terrorism refer only to those violent acts which are intended to create fear terror, are perpetuated for a religious, political, or ideological goal, and deliberately targeted to disregard the safety of non-combatants. I'm going to go out here, I'm going to say this, I'm throwing it out here just for discussion, that they need to have a separate definition for racists that would include at the end of that definition and our Muslims. Remember the uproar on Fox when the Times Square bomber was caught and O'Reilly and friends complained that Obama would not use the phrase Islamic terrorist to describe the man? It seems that Fox and friends want to reserve the word terrorist for Muslims. Anybody see 1984? Remember there always had to be an enemy. The really discomforting thing about this article is that it's from the Associated Press, not Fox. <clears throat> Pure racism, a really racist message. I need to go back to BP for a moment before it completely disappears and our opportunity is lost. Earlier today, I talked about the need for a constitutional amendment to revoke Exxon and BP's right to free speech as a person granted by the conservative Supreme Court of Justice Roberts. Throughout my BP rants, I showed the structural regulatory defect that allowed BP to donate as much as it wants to congressional campaigns with no term limits in sight and how these companies wink wink nod nod promise jobs to the regulators when those regulators leave government service and these companies ultimately write their own regulations please see my BP rant that talks about the Arctic drilling that BP is doing on an island that it built in the Beaufort Sea to avoid offshore drilling rules they built an island to avoid offshore drilling rules and this is allowed so there is this defect that needs to be fixed constitutionally. I said that I wish that the gusher had continued through the elections and on to the inauguration of the newly elected Senate and House members. Oh well, I just can't leave it alone, I guess. An article in the Statesman dated August 17, 2010, related to this, is titled, Happily, New Deep Water Oil Drilling to Face Greater Scrutiny. And then on the carryover page, the title is, Shrimpers report good first day, but analysis shows much of the oil remains. Yay! I am so happy. Everything's good and getting better. New regulations will keep a gusher like this from happening again. And we can keep getting cheap oil from nearby wells. Yay! That's my Glenn Beck imitation of his fake laughter. The article says that the Interior Department is not going to grant automatic exemptions from doing an environmental assessment. That's what happened in the Beaufort Sea also. Actually, I predict there will be plenty of exemptions starting about a year from now, barring another disaster. The same structural defect that allowed BP to muscle the Minerals Management Service is still here. Nothing has changed. Nothing. Nothing. I absolutely guarantee that the Beaufort Sea offshore on a privately built island well will be drilled. It'll just happen after the election. Republicans counter when I bring up the portion of the structural defect that allows Exxon or BP to donate as much as they want to political campaigns. They counter that unions can donate as much as they want to also. By the way, don't ever use that argument on me. It shows your ignorance of the deeper issue. The fact is, the Republicans are correct. Just don't use the argument, okay? The Republicans are correct in small part. And here I say, wake up, Obama-loving lefties. This past week, Obama signed a $26 billion teacher and state, teacher and state aid package, stimulus package, whatever you want to call it. This money does not go to corporations, but it goes to the states, which includes unions of state workers and teachers another piece of evidence of a structural regulatory defect in the system. They lobbied for it, just as Exxon and BP lobby for their regulations. It's the same structural problem as before. They deliver the votes and campaign funds. Exxon delivers campaign funds and maybe some votes from their 
corporate people. I call it more of the same. We need a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United. Please, please go to moveon.org and sign that petition only. There's some other stuff they have that I don't, uh, I'm not buying. Okay. I talked last week about health care in, uh, in response to an email regarding the right of an individual to get together with other individuals and create a medical advance or invention. And I quote, but if a small group funds a medical advance for their own selfish purpose with the specific intent of keeping it only to themselves, as abhorrent as that might sound, it's not unfair, close quotes, this friend of mine wrote to me. I need to go back and review what I said in healthcare number one. Arguments against Obamacare, and I use that message word to define what got passed, not how I feel about it, talk about how health care will be rationed in the future. Listen up. Health care is already rationed. If rationed means you cannot get whatever you want under your plan. Just go see the movie Sicko or ask a few friends about if they have ever been denied coverage. Also, there are co-pays and deductibles and maximums. For rich people, they get whatever they want. They use cash. As we go towards Obamacare, companies, hospitals, and doctors will stop accepting Medicare and Medicaid and will only cater to the rich for cash. Some of them. This is already happening. The government will end up buying these hospitals. This is Goldie's prediction. Will end up buying these hospitals and hiring doctors for less than they now make. The rich people have nothing to fear under this system. They have the money. They get the new chemo. We, those of us who are not rich, on the other hand, will not get whatever we want. We'll get the five-year-old chemo, and in my opinion, I suspect that we will get even less in the future than we get now. Not as a product of Obamacare, but as a result of our loss of wealth and declining standard of living, which I put forth in several prior rants. I use the phrase new chemo versus five-year-old chemo as an exaggerated argument to help you visualize the point. It's like a Socratic method. Yes, we all hope that we won't need chemo, but it's a fact of life that the rich get more services because they have more money. That's the point of having the more money. My main point last week was that if this small group of people get together and pool their resources and don't use any taxpayer money, which taxpayer money I define as an item of the commons, out of my commons rants, these people, if they don't use those commons money, the taxpayer money, they can do whatever they want. They can use the existing patent laws and enjoy the fruits of their labor. If they take any taxpayer money or tax breaks, again, I define those assists of a, of a taxpayer money or tax breaks as a commons. Then we have a right to the fruits of that labor. That was my point about that, trying to define commons and if commons is used. If you don't use commons, you can invent whatever you want. As far as a drug, you can keep it for yourself. So I was watching O'Reilly last night. It's fun. I had too much time on my hands. He had Dennis Miller on. And O'Reilly asked Miller about the mosque at Ground Zero, which I call the mosque not at Ground Zero. I was, I was excited to hear what, what these guys were going to spew. Well, Miller responded that he did not want to say that they didn't have the right to build there, but that they would have more friends in the United States if they didn't build there. So he was actually saying they have the right to build there, but it's not a good idea to build it there. As I contained my real happiness over his absolutely correct comments, I was confronted by the idea of etiquette or politeness. If you know that your host does not like a certain word or phrase, for example, like Jew me down or the flying of the Confederate flag or the saying of the N-word, then why would you do it? It's etiquette, politeness. I was speaking with a friend of mine, an intelligent Republican, earlier, and we agreed that they do have the right to put the mosque there, but there's no doubt that some people are going to be offended by the location. Although I did get him to agree that it's too bad that they even have to worry about offending anyone, as a Christian church at that location would have been met by full crickets in the media. I'm not saying we all have to be politically correct. But if you can teach your child that the flying of the Confederate flag is a fundamental freedom of speech right, and following that teaching, let him know that someone may be offended by you flying it on your truck, 
you've succeeded. More importantly, you should not argue with the offended person as to whether they should or shouldn't be offended. So Miller's argument that they have the right to do it there, but it's a violation of etiquette or politeness, that's actually, that's a good argument. It's too bad, like I said, it's too bad that you have to say this specific group needs to be more polite by not putting it there. But it is a politeness or etiquette argument. It's not a right. At least some in the media are now saying they do have the right to build it there. At the beginning of this argument, they were not saying they had the right. Okay. I want to give you a uh, thought of the day, and it's tangentially related to a Seinfeld episode. This is from a friend of mine that lives in Samra. She's an expatriate. She broke up with her local boyfriend. It made him panic, and he said, I want to have a baby with you. I heard that and laughed. When a guy says that to you after you've broken up with him, you have hand, as Seinfeld, actually Kramer, put it in Costa Rica. That's all there is today. I think that next week I may do a summary for handy reference. Since I reference past theories quite often without explaining them, tragedy of the commons, you know, slippery slope, etc. I want to thank our sponsors, all of which support this form of conversation, which is one way, at least during the rants, and two way when you call me later or email me. And they don't necessarily uh, agree with the content of this conversation. Piano by Angelo.com, that's Angelo Limbesis, who teaches and plays keyboards all over Austin for cocktail parties, holiday parties, anything. ZitaDesign.com, Z I T A Design.com, for all of your decorative painting needs. She can make anything look like anything. AustinAreaPlumbing.com for all of your plumbing problems and redos. Tico AdventureLodge.com, T I C O AdventureLodge.com, a small hotel in Samra, Costa Rica. CNC Surf School in Samra, which is C N C Surf Samara, S A M A R A, dot webs dot com. La Vela Latina, great sunset restaurant in Samra, Costa Rica, and Amhar Tequila at www dot s a n t o spirits dot com an extremely smooth tequila thanks and god bless i hope to see you next week at same time